Welcome to the world of Debussy's Preludes for the Piano. Debussy was in his late 40s when he wrote two books of piano preludes. These were the years 1909 to 1913, the culmination of the Belle Epoque. They were the years before the outbreak of World War I, when Paris was overflowing with cultural richness. Debussy had already created three quarters of his output. He'd written Afternoon of a Fawn, his opera Peleos and Melisande, La Mer, and lots of piano music and songs. He was now married to Emma Bardak, his second wife, and living in a fashionable part of Paris. In contrast to his earlier bohemian appearance, he was now well-dressed and usually wore a bowler hat. His beloved daughter, Shushu, was five when he began writing the preludes. A study of the piano preludes gives us an opportunity to explore the symbiotic relationship between Debussy and the city of Paris. Debussy absorbed Parisian trends in art, literature, and pop culture. Images from the Orient, Spain, Italy, Scotland, ancient legends, poetry, and caricatures from the music hall all stimulated Debussy's imagination and were turned into preludes. There are two volumes, each containing 12 preludes. Volume 1 was published in 1910. When Debussy called these pieces preludes, he was indicating that they were to continue the lineage of a musical form used by Bach and Chopin. The prelude is a short musical form, usually containing just one idea and one basic pianistic texture. Most of Debussy's preludes are just three to four minutes long. Unlike Bach and Chopin, Debussy gave titles to his preludes, but to everyone's bewilderment, he put them at the end of each piece, in parentheses. Despite his elusiveness about these titles, we're grateful to have them. They take us into the music quickly and enable us to listen more effectively. While the preludes can be enjoyed singly or in various groupings, they're even more wonderful when they're heard continuously in the order he placed them, preferably with each book of 12 preludes at a single sitting. There are important relationships between the preludes, an ideal progression of keys, and a satisfying dramatic and emotional structure. The years of the World's Fairs of 1889 and 1900 found Parisians obsessed with exoticism. European colonialism was in its heyday, and the term Oriental was invented. It referred to Asia, of course, but it also uh, referred to the Middle East and North Africa. The Orient also included the mythic worlds of ancient Greece and Egypt, which Europeans idealized as the source of their culture. In the term Oriental, Europeans were seeking mystery, glamour, and glimpses of sexual freedom unavailable in their repressed, conservative society. Many of Debussy's preludes celebrate Oriental objects and legends. The first prelude, The Dancers of Delphi, was inspired by a visit Debussy made to the Louvre. On the landing of the Grand Staircase, he saw a plaster copy of a supporting column that had recently been unearthed at Delphi in Greece. Delphi was the site of the Temple of Apollo, the home of the Muses, and the Delphic Oracle. On this column, Debussy observed three dancers circling in a serene procession. They're barefoot, wearing tunics, and one lifts her arm to sound finger symbols. For Debussy, the dancers inspired a vision of the noble classicism that we can also see on Greek vases. He brought this vision to life in his first prelude. It so happened that Debussy made a piano recording of this piece in 1913. It's not perfect because composers at that time weren't very interested in piano roll recordings. But I think it's great that we can actually hear a performance by Debussy himself. So here he is playing the dancers of Delphi.
If you have perfect pitch, you'll have noticed that this prelude ended in B-flat. B-flat will be heard sounding through the next two preludes as well. Even if you don't have perfect pitch, as you gain familiarity with this music, you'll feel how this pitch serves to unify the first three preludes and prepare for an arresting shift in the fourth prelude. The second prelude is called voile, which can mean sails or veils in French. Debussy valued this ambiguity and never committed to either definition. Sails filling with wind and drawing boats across the water is quite a different image than a seductive woman dancing with scarves. This woman is Lottie Fuller, an American dancer who preceded Isadora Duncan in fascinating the French with her whirling fabric performances. At the same time, there was Strauss's Salome with her Dance of the Seven Veils, which was much discussed in Paris. Many music historians believe that Debussy was inspired by these veiled dancers, especially since the first prelude also alludes to dancers. But I personally find this music more abstract. I don't sense a human presence in it. For me, it's just fabric floating in the air. But whatever imagery motivated Debussy, this prelude was the first entirely whole-tone composition that he published. He'd written many whole-tone passages in his music, but in this piece, except for a short pentatonic burst of color in the middle, the music is entirely constructed from the six notes of the whole-tone scale. When we listen to whole-tone music, there's no sense of a fixed home note that we have to return to. There's no tension, just floating and drifting like water or wind. Our pianist is Russian, Anna Tsipuleva, playing sails or veils. More than any other composer, Debussy was immersed in the literary scene of his time. His preludes contain many references to poetry and literature. The next prelude, The Wind on the Plain, is named for a famous line of poetry from the 18th century, which became a motto for one of Debussy's favorite poets, Verlaine. In the French language, the wind on the plain holds its breath is a particularly beautiful sounding poetic line. Debussy refers to Verlaine's motto in many of his songs, as well as in this prelude. He explores musically what the wind is like when it blows across a plain or a landscape. He has an uncanny ability to recall the varied sounds of wind and to translate them into pianistic textures. Occasionally, a steady breeze is interrupted by a sudden gust or squall. Here's a performance by Sviatoslav Richter from the early years of video, The Wind on the Plain.
The fourth prelude begins by stepping down from the B-flat of the first three preludes into a new tonality. We've left the wild, natural world and find ourselves in a contemporary human world with its sounds, scents, and fragments of a remembered waltz. This prelude is often called the Baudelaire prelude because the influential French poet Baudelaire wrote its title line, Sounds and perfumes turn in the air of evening. Although Baudelaire died when Debussy was still a child, his influence on French cultural trends was going to be pervasive for the next 50 years. Baudelaire explored two poles of human existence, the spiritual and the depraved. His famous collection of poetry, Fleur de Mal, was the Bible for Debussy's symbolist generation, and Baudelaire's work inspired Debussy throughout his life. In this exceptionally original prelude, Debussy expresses in music the changeful nature of consciousness. Sense impressions and memories arise and are replaced by other impressions. A mood of inexpressible longing prevails as layers of melody and harmony, including memories of a present-day waltz tune, fade in and out of the mind. This is music that could never have been imagined before Debussy. Many artists have recorded this magical prelude, but I believe this 1978 performance by the American pianist Paul Jacobs is the most poetic. I'll also show you the first few lines of the poem in English. Debussy now turns his imagination to the island of Capri in the Bay of Naples, south of Rome. There's a little village in the mountains called Anna Capri, which is renowned for its healing properties. Debussy was already struggling with the rectal cancer that would ultimately kill him. As he wrote the preludes, he found relief in escaping to beautiful and mysterious places that could cure the body and soul. It's said that Debussy began writing this prelude after looking at the label on a bottle of Anna Capri wine. The prelude opens with distant bells floating on the air. Then we begin to hear fragmentary impressions of a distant tarantella. The tarantella is a dance based on dotted rhythms which originated on Capri. As we come closer, the tarantella becomes increasingly vivid. Then we hear fragments of two songs. They could be Neapolitan folk songs or current popular songs. The second one is almost a tongue-in-cheek cliché. Debussy loved to juxtapose these contemporary materials with his own music. He concludes the prelude by blending the various musical elements together for a thrilling climax and a joyous affirmation of life. The performer is French, Ariane Jacob playing the hills of Anna Capri.
The next prelude, Footprints in the Snow, seems to be an intimate revelation of Debussy's fundamental loneliness and isolation. There's no record of the origins of this despairing prelude. It was written just the day after the exuberant previous prelude, The Hills of Anna Capri. What we do know is that Debussy wrote two other sorrowful compositions that take place in a frozen landscape. These pieces both depict a scene where two lovers confront each other when love has ended. A haunting, obsessive rhythmic motif opens the piece, and it's heard almost continuously throughout. In the score, Debussy says that this rhythmic motif should create the impression of a melancholy, snowbound landscape. A human figure is trudging through the snow with great difficulty, leaving footprints behind him. He seems profoundly burdened by the fragments of a melody that pass through his mind, like memories of someone pleading with him or gently reproaching. Three times during the piece, these memories become so intense that he has to stop, unable to continue. Then the desolate trudging begins again. Evgeny Korolyov is the pianist in this memorable performance of Footprints in the Snow. We now return with Debussy to the world of wild nature where insignificant humans can only look on in awe and terror. The prelude is called What the West Wind Saw. Debussy read a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale which personified each of the winds. This gave him the idea of musically characterizing the ferocious west wind and imagining it reveling in its destructive power. Beginning out on the Atlantic Ocean, the wind swirls and gathers force. Soon it's sweeping mountainous waves and icebergs ahead of its path, lashing the coastline and destroying houses and ships. Of all the preludes, what the west wind saw demands the most virtuosity of the performer. Its pianistic violence is unparalleled in Debussy's output, requiring violent torrents of sound alternating with sinister, sudden pianissimos. The piece is superhuman in both its vision and in its execution. Here's a performance by Richter. I hope you'll join me next time to continue this exploration of Book One of Debussy's Preludes. In the meantime, these performances can all be found on YouTube, and you can also hear Book One complete. With this kind of music, there's no substitute for repeated listening. You'll always hear more. <laughs>